Shadow and Bone is an upcoming fantasy streaming television series developed by Eric Heisserer and 21 Laps Entertainment for Netflix that is scheduled to premiere its first season consisting of eight episodes on April 23rd, 2021. It is based on Lee Bardugo's worldwide best-selling Grishaverse novels. This series will feature events that took place in the Grisha trilogy beginning with Shadow and Bone, as well as the sequel series known as the Six of Crows duology. There are more books within this world, including King of Scars and its sequel, Rule of Wolves, which just came out this year on March. March 30th, as well as a few novellas such as The Language of Thorns and The Lives of Saints. The series was revealed to be in the works in January 2019 and Netflix just released a trailer last month. I did do a trailer breakdown if you're interested in seeing that. However, that video is full of book spoilers, whereas this video will be spoiler free. If you're looking for a basic rundown of the world of the Grishaverse, basic plot points to look out for, politics, religion, and short character bios, all without spoilers, this is the video for you. Before we start, make sure to subscribe and hit that like button so you can continue to keep up with mine and my husband Carlos's shadow and bone content. We'll be doing more reactions, discussions, and episode breakdowns that you won't want to miss. We have an entire playlist of Shadow and Bone content that will be linked down below. Shadow and Bone finds us in a war-torn world where lowly orphan, soldier, and map maker Alina Starkov has just unleashed an extraordinary power that could be the key to setting her country free. With the monstrous threat of the Shadow Fold looming, Alina is torn from everything she knows to train as part of an elite army of magical soldiers. Users of magic in this world are known as Grisha. But she struggles to hone her power. She finds that allies and enemies can be one and the same and that nothing in this lavish world is what it seems. There are dangerous forces at play, including a crew of charismatic criminals, and it will take more than magic to survive. All right, let's talk about our main cast. First, we have Jesse May Lee playing Alina Starkov, an orphan and soldier who makes maps for the First Army. I will break down the differences between the First and Second Army in a little bit. She enters the shadow fold at the beginning of the book and after an attack unleashes the power she previously did not know she had. After this comes to light, she is sent to the capital of her country of Ravka by Ben Barnes's character. General Kerrigan, who hopes that if she learns to hone her powers, then together they will be able to get rid of the shadow fold that causes Ravka to be cut into. At the capital, she learns more about the Grisha, the shadow fold, and how to use her newly discovered powers. Archie Renault plays Malian Oritsev, who is Alina's lifelong best friend as they grew up in an orphanage together. He is a fellow soldier of the First Army with an uncanny knack for tracking. Ben Barnes plays General Kerrigan, aka the Darkling, the powerful shadow summoner and the leader of the Second Army, which is is the army of Grisha magic wielders. Freddie Carter plays Kaz Brecker, a scheming criminal from Kerch and leader of the Crows. Amita Suman as Inej Gaffa, a skilled spy known as the Wraith, who has a background in acrobatics and works with Kaz Brecker. Pitt Young plays Jesper Fahey, a sharpshooter who can't walk away from a wager and co-conspirator in all the shenanigans Kaz Brecker gets into. These six are the main cast and will appear in all episodes of season one. Some of the recurring cast includes Danielle Galligan as Nina Zenik, a Grisha heartrender and lover of waffles, who is affiliated with both the Ravkins and with Kaz Brecker. Callahan Skogman as Matthias Helvar, a Fyrden witch hunter, aka Drusko, who gets caught up in some trouble with Nina Zenik. Daisy Head plays Jenya Safin, a Grisha tailor who works at the palace and becomes one of Alina's first friends after she arrives at the capital. Sujaya Dasgupta as Zoya Nazielenski, a powerful Grisha squalor, who can manipulate the air and member of the second army. So we want to make her as Bagra, who is tasked with teaching Alina to hone her sun summoning powers. Kevin Eldon as the Apparat, a religious man who works as the spiritual advisor to the King of Ravka. And Luke Pascalino as David Kostik, a Grisha fabricator who works at the capital for General Kerrigan and the second army. The world of the Grishaverse is comprised of several countries, a few of whom have been at war with each other for some time, which has left Ravka with many orphans. One of these orphans is our main character, Alina Starkov. Her country of Ravka, which has, as I said, been at war with both of their neighbors, Fjorda to the north and Shuhan to the south. While Ravka reveres the magic users known as Grisha, Fjorda treats them as witches and burns them, while the Shu enslave or experiment on them. This war is made harder on Ravka because the country of Ravka is torn in two by a massive swath of darkness known as the Shadow Fold, also referred to as the Unsee or the Fold. This swath of darkness cuts off Ravka's entire western part and from trade, and people don't normally come back out of the Unsee alive because of the monster that reside within. The first army of Ravka, also known as the King's Army, is Ravka's first line of defense against outside threats, including the Fjordans to the north and the Shu to the south, as well as the flesh-eating monsters that live within the Shadow Fold. The second army is a military regiment that is based in the Little Palace in the Ravkin capital of Osalta. 
In contrast to the first army, which is comprised entirely of non-Grisha, the second army is made up of only Grisha. There is a natural rivalry bordering on hostility between the first and second armies arising from a mistrust of Grisha power on the part of the first army and a scorn for the ordinariness of the Odkazatsia, which means the abandoned, on the part of the second army, which is how they refer to people who do not have Grisha powers. This friction exemplifies the wider conflict between Grisha and the magicless peoples who have historically feared and persecuted them. As I said, Fjorda is the northernmost nation with Ravka to its south and it's a frigid and mountainous country. Fjordans perceive Grisha power as dangerous and witch-like and they train their Druskel, which translates to witch hunters, to hunt and kill Grisha. This hostility obviously puts Fjorda at off with Ravka who train their Grisha as soldiers. Shuhan is the nation and homeland of the Shu people. It's bordered the north by Ravka and to the west by Kerch, which it is connected to via land bridges. The Shu are known for their scientific advancements through the arguably inhumane treatment of their Grisha. Their technology is shown to rival Ravka's. Kerch is a small island nation located in the True Sea. It is bordered to the east by Shuhan, which again, it's connected to via land bridges. The hub of all international trade, Kerch relies on sea transport and its own neutrality in world affairs to maintain its position in the global economy. Although slavery is illegal in Kerch, Grisha and others are often bound to wealthy merchants as indentures under terms that amount to slavery. Ketterdam is the capital of Kerch. The city is a bustling hub for international trade and home to multiple criminal organizations, including one called the Dregs, which is under the control of the infamous Kaz Brecker. Other countries in this world include Novizem, which is a young country compared to the other nations. The wide expanse of the True Sea keeps Novizem separated from global conflict, allowing the nation to prosper. It has lots of farmland. It is also known for being a refuge for people, both Grisha and Okazatia, which again is a word that translates to abandoned, meant to denote those who do not have Grisha powers. Novizem is a place where people can begin a new life in anonymity. Fan favorite Jasper Fahey is the many though he now resides in Kerch, but he's originally from a farm on Novi Zem. And lastly, there's the Wandering Isle, which is a nation located to the north of Novi Zem and west across the True Sea from Ravka. Its people are called the Kalish. They are typically red-headed and pale-skinned. We don't see too much of it in the books, and I'll be surprised if it comes up very much in the show. All right, let's talk a bit about the plot. So in the beginning of the first book, Alina Starkov enters the fold with some Grisha and some other members of the First Army, including her longtime friend Mao, on a boat that travels across sand known as a sand skiff. Within the Shadow Fold, they are attacked by the creatures that live within, known as the Volcra. They are saved by a searing burst of light that comes from Alina herself. She's brought before the Shadow Summoner, who confirms she does have the ability to summon the sun, and he immediately escorts her to the Robkin capital of Os Alta, where the palace is and where Grisha soldiers are trained. In the original trilogy, we spend the majority of our time in Ravka, but in the sequel duology, Six of Crows, we move over initially to Kerch, where we meet the crows in the capital city of Ketterdam. Speaking of whom, let's talk about how they've combined the timelines of Alina's part in the story with the crows part in this story. So interestingly, the events of Six of Crows duology are actually set years after the original trilogy. However, executive producer Eric Heiser and Lee Bardugo confirmed that the characters in Six of Crows would be aged up and featured in the first season of Shadow and Bone, and that we would see the characters from both series meet up. They referred to the show as high budget fan fiction. The way that they've combined these timelines based on the trailer is that not only have they aged up the crows, but season one will serve as a sort of prequel happening before the heist events that transpire in the first book of the Six of Crows duology. In the trailer, we see that not only will Ravkin enemies in Shuhan and Fjorda be after Alina, the newly revealed sun summoner, but the crows, Inej the Wraith, Jesper the sharpshooter, and Kaz Brecker the fearless scheming leader, are off to collect a reward for retrieving the Sun Summoner. This plot line did not exist in the books, but if you ask me, it's a very smart and exciting way to combine the timelines. All right, so let me explain Grisha magic. The Grisha are the magical elite of Ravka, also known as the soldiers of the Second Army. They practice the small science. They manipulate matter at its most fundamental levels. Think of it as a magical version of molecular chemistry. There are three orders of Grisha, Corporalkai, Etherealkai, and Materialkai. Corporalkai is the order of the living and the dead and consists of heart renders, healers, and tailors. A heart render can snatch the air from your lungs, slow your pulse until you drop into a coma, or literally crush your heart. Healers can obviously heal you, and tailors have the ability to change their appearance and the appearance of others, sometimes permanently depending on the talent of the tailor. 
fan favorite Jenya Safin is a talented tailor. Ethereokai is the order of the summoners. This includes Squallers, Inferni, and Tidemakers. Grisha cannot create or animate matter. Inferni don't magically create fire. They summon combustible gases like methane or hydrogen, but still need a flint to start a spark. Squallers can raise or lower air pressure to create storms, while tide makers use temperature and pressure to summon and control water. Fan favorite Zoya Nazielenski is a powerful squalor. Ethrielkai frequently work in pairs. And side note, Alina, the sun summoner, and the darkling, the shadow summoner, are technically considered ethereal guy since they are both summoners. Material guy is the order of fabricators and includes Duras and Alchemy. These are the lab geeks of the Grisha orders. They are the least respected, but they became increasingly valuable to the war effort as enemy military innovations began to surpass the power of Grisha magic. Duras steel in the solid, Grisha steel, core cloth, which is similar to modern body armor, textiles and glass, while Alchemy specialize in poisons and blasting powders. But since Alchemy and Duras often share their workspace and do similar work, they usually aren't distinguished and are simply referred to as fabricators. Fan favorite David Kostick is a fabricator. You may have noticed these amazing costumes in the trailer. Shout out to the show's fantastic costume designer, Wendy Partridge, for bringing these incredible keftas to life. A kefta is a garment that is worn by Grisha in the Robkin Second Army. The color of a Grisha's kefta is determined by their Krisha order, and the color of the embroidery on the cuffs and the hems signifies the wearer's specific abilities or their type within the Grisha order. Because Kefta are worn by Ravkin Grisha in many settings, including combat and formal settings and day-to-day -day life, the garment is a prominent characteristic used to identify Grisha in many countries. As a result, some Grisha and nations like Kerch will wear Kefta to indicate their powers, but outside of Ravka, they're used largely for ornamental purposes and usually are of much poorer quality than those made in the Little Palace. So to break down the color schemes, Corporal Guy Grisha wear red kefta and the embroidery will denote what specific type of Corporal Guy they are. Black is for heart renders, gray is for healers, and blue is for tailors. Ethereal Guy wear blue kefta and the embroidery will either be pale blue for tide makers, red for inferni, or silver for squalors. Material Guy wear purple kefta and the embroidery will either be gray for duras or red for alchemy. But there are some exceptions to this, so the darkling, being the only shadow summoner, wears a all-black kefta. White kefta with gold cuffs denotes service in the Grand Palace at the Ravkin capital, like you see Jenya wearing here. And lastly, a gold kefta seen here in the trailer worn by Elena Starkov marks her as the Sun Summoner. Lastly, let's briefly touch on the religious beliefs that appear in the Grisha verse as they do come up and they are important. So firstly, in Ravka, their faith is based on many saints who performed miracles. In Shadow and Bone the Book, the apparat, who again is the spiritual advisor to the king, gives Alina a book called Istori Sanka, which translates to the lives of saints. And Lee Bardugo finally actually wrote this book, and it was just published back in October of 2020. A version of it written in Ravkin will appear within the show. In the books, Inej Gaffa is known for her faith in the saints being important to her, and she's even named two of her daggers after two of the saints. And then there's the uber religious Fjordans. Jell is the god worshipped by the Fjordans. He is said to have built the ice court, the military stronghold and seat of nobility in Fjorda, located in the Fjordan capital of Jerholm. The ice court appears in the first book of the Six of Crows duology. Jell is also said to work through ash trees. It is in the burial ritual of the Fjordans that they be buried near the roots of an ash tree so that they may take root. Jell will likely be mentioned by our resident zealot here, Matthias, who is a follower of Jell, and a Druskel, which again translates to witch hunter as the Fjordans believe that Grisha are witches who need to be destroyed. That's your basic primer on the world of Shadow and Bone. Comment down below if you're as excited for the show as we are and leave any questions you have down there as well. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe and I will see you all on April 23rd.